Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of the History Guy is brought to you by Magellan TV a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episodes, we are talking about two stories of U.S. Navy destroyers. The first story is about the USS Fanning, which took part in the sinking of the first German submarine sunk by American ships during World War I. Then the History Guy skips ahead a few decades to the USS Roper, which in April of 1942 engaged a submarine off the coast of Virginia. The sinking of U-85 would be the first German submarine sunk by U.S. forces in World War II. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. The Allies received an unexpected bit of intelligence, if disturbing news, in May of 1917, when an interview with a crewman of a German submarine was published in a Dutch newspaper. The crewman noted that the newest German submarines could outrun the fastest merchant vessels on the surface, and that the Kaiser had 325 submarines in his service. It was a desperate time for the Entente nations. In February, the Germans had resumed unrestricted submarine warfare, and by cutting the line of supply, they had brought Britain nearly to the brink of starvation. But the Entente tactics were changing, and a new ally had entered the war. The crewman that was interviewed in the newspaper was a crewman aboard the submarine SEM U-58, and coincidentally it would be the U-58 that would meet that new ally the following November. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In December 1916, German Admiral Hennig Rudolf Adolf Karl von Holzendorf proposed a daring plan to the Kaiser. The German U-boat campaign had been effective in the beginning of the war, but had been limited since 1915 subject to so-called prize rules that required the submarine to stop a ship and place the crew in a place of safety before sinking it. The limit was to placate the United States, furious at the 1915 sinking of the luxury liner Lusitania. Von Holzendorf's memorandum recommended resuming unrestricted submarine warfare. Von Holzendorf argued that an all-out U-boat campaign would starve Britain and force them to sue for peace within six months. While such an action would almost certainly draw the U.S. into the war, the plan postulated that cutting off the British line of supply would end the war before the U.S. could mobilize enough troops to make a difference. And even if Americans tried to send troops, von Holzendorf promised that the U-boats would sink the transports, promising the Kaiser that not one American would land on the continent. At first, the plan went as expected. In the first six months of 1917, a quarter of all Britain-bound shipping was sunk. But also, as expected, the campaign drew the U.S. into the war, with the declaration coming April 6th. When U.S. Rear Admiral William Sims arrived in London later that month, he was told that if the German submarine campaign went unchecked, Germany would win the war. The Grand Fleet was stretched thin, and the U.S. Navy ill-prepared. The proposed solution was to use a convoy system, a system that Britain had resisted as it delayed ship schedules. Vessels would travel in convoys, protected by escorts, now supplemented with U.S. destroyers. The U.S. sent squadrons of destroyers to the Irish port of Queenstown, now called Cove. Sims would have preferred a base in France, but there weren't enough resupply facilities available. Some of the first Americans to enter the war were sailors, based on U.S. destroyers in Queenstown, escorting ships in the Battle of the Atlantic. It was grueling work patrolling the North Atlantic, seeking the elusive U-boats. Six months after U.S. destroyers started arriving in Ireland, the U.S. crews were much more experienced, but had yet to confirm a single U-boat kill. If they did encounter a U-boat, however, they had the service of a new and powerful anti-submarine weapon. Developed by Royal Navy engineer and inventor Herbert Taylor, the depth charge was essentially a mine fitted with a hydrostatic pistol set to detonate the mine at a preset depth based on water pressure. The first successful use to destroy a submarine had been in March of 1916. The U.S. had requested full working drawings in 1917, and U.S. depth charges, called the Mark II, were virtually identical to the British Type D charge except with an improved hydrostatic gun. The barrel-like charges carried 300 pounds of TNT each, were loaded on two racks on the back of the destroyer. The depth charge was a simple weapon, but while they were the best anti-submarine weapon available, they were nonetheless difficult to use, 
There was no effective way to locate a submerged submarine, and the 300-pound explosive was only dangerous to submarines within about 140 feet. The convoy system worked around the limits of the range and capabilities of submarines of the era. Most submarines could only operate within about three days of base. This placed the greatest risks as ships neared Britain. For most of an Atlantic crossing, a convoy could only have a single escort, but additional escorts would be provided in the danger zone. U.S. destroyers and escorts from Queenstown would escort convoys out of Queenstown west through the danger zone. The ships would meet at a rendezvous point where they would meet a convoy headed to British ports and escort them back through the danger zone. On a foggy November 17th, a destroyer division consisting of six U.S. destroyers and two British corvettes was escorting convoy OQ-20 with eight merchant vessels out of Queenstown. The escort was under the command of 40-year-old United States Navy commander Frank Berrien. A 1900 graduate of the United States Naval Academy, Berrien had served as the Academy football coach from 1908 to 1910, earning a record of 21 wins, 5 losses, 3 ties. Berrien commanded USS Nicholson. Commissioned at the end of April 1915, the Nicholson was an O'Brien-class destroyer, one of six United States Navy had ordered in 1913. A development of the Casson class at 305 feet 3 inches, the O'Brien class was larger than the previous U.S. destroyers in order to mount larger 21-inch torpedo tubes. The ship also mounted four 4-inch four Mark 9 guns and two racks of the new Mark II depth charges on the back. The harbor was protected with anti-submarine netting, so the ships would have to come through single file and some 10 miles out to sea be organized into the convoy formation, in this case four columns of two ships each. This was a particularly vulnerable point for the convoy. The ships were intermingled and moving slowly. The escorts were not in position as they were carrying messages and giving instructions. But convoy OQ-20 was particularly vulnerable because there was already one of the dreaded U-boats in its midst. Part of the German second submarine flotilla, the SM U-58 was one of 12 Type 57 ocean-going diesel-powered torpedo attack boats of the Imperial German Navy. The 219-foot, 10-inch long submarine had a range of some 7,000 nautical miles, could submerge up to 50 meters, or about 164 feet. In addition to a 4.1-inch deck gun, the submarine carried seven torpedoes, with two tubes each in the bow and the stern. The boat was commanded by 30-year-old Captain Lieutenant Gustav Amberger, only eight days into a new command, having previously commanded the SMU-80. Commissioned in August 1916, the U-58 was on its eighth patrol and had sunk 21 vessels already in the first battle of the Atlantic, including the 202-ton British sailing ship SS Dolly Varden just three days earlier, Amberger's first kill in command of U-58. Amberger had previous knowledge that a convoy was going to depart and had been avoiding patrols for two days, waiting for this moment to attack. The day had almost started with a disaster for U-58, as they heard the screws of the convoy, Amberger had taken the boat to periscope death, only to find himself on a collision course with the USS Nicholson. Amberger had to order the engines full back to avoid a collision, but the Nicholson had not seen them, and he maneuvered for another try. As the last of the merchant ships, the SS René, was moving into position, Amberger was lining up to attack the British merchant steamer SS Welshman. Amberger extended the periscope to prepare his attack. The U-58 was in an excellent position to attack the Welshman, but as Amberger looked at his periscope, to his surprise he realized that one of the U.S. destroyers was very close aboard and bearing down on the U-58. The approaching ship was the USS Fanning, moving quickly to assume its position covering the rear of the convoy. The Fanning was under the command of 33-year-old Lieutenant Arthur Carpenter, a 1908 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy who had participated in the 1914 occupation of Vera Cruz. The Fanning was a Paulding-class vessel, smaller and older than the Nicholson, mounting 18-inch rather than 21-inch torpedoes and five 3-inch guns. Like Nicholson, she had also had two racks of the Mark II depth charges added to her stern. Coincidentally, this was not USS Fanning's first encounter with U-58. In October 1916, before the U.S. had entered the war, Fanning had recovered survivors of ships sunk by the U-58 off Nantucket. The telescope was the type that the Allies called the Finger Telescope. It was very thin, only stuck up out of the water about 10 inches, and as the U-58 was barely moving, it wouldn't have left the V-shaped wake that tended to indicate a periscope. So when Amberger saw the Fanning so close by, he quickly lowered the periscope, hoping to avoid detection for the second time that day. And U-58 might have avoided detection for the second time that day, were it not for the coxswain standing watch on the bridge of the USS Fanning. Daniel David Loomis had what one officer described as 
a most extraordinary set of eyes. In foggy conditions, Lewis spotted the tiny, just inch and a half diameter periscope, 400 yards off the Fanning's port bow. Telescope, he yelled. 25-year-old Lieutenant Walter Owen Henry was officer of the deck. He ordered general quarters, called for the rudder hard left and full speed. As Rear Admiral Walter Sims noted in his description of the encounter, it's not the simplest thing, even when the submarine was so obviously located as this one apparently was, to reach the spot accurately. The story would have to make a wide turn, it's easy to miss the spot, but Henry directed the Fanning perfectly, and as she rolled over the spot where Loomis had seen the periscope, they rolled off one of the Mark II depth charges. And they weren't the only ones there. As soon as they heard the report, Barry and Head rushed the Nicholson through the convoy. They made a hard left, kicked off another depth charge near the Fanning. The U.S. destroyers had acted quickly, but they knew, after months of service with no confirmed U-boat sinkings, that U-boats were hard to catch, and the depth charges had to be spot on. And there was a problem. The first depth charge had exploded prematurely, and so shaken the fanning that it had temporarily disabled the main generator. If the U-boat came up in attack position, fanning would have been unable to maneuver, a sitting duck. But the wake from the explosion subsided. Fanning restarted her generator, and Nicholson made a sweep. They were desperately searching for a sign that they had scored a hit, but none appeared. It seemed another frustrating event in what Admiral Sims described as months of fruitless battle with nothing but oil slicks, wakes, tide rips, streaks of suds, and suspicious disturbances on the water. Fifteen minutes ticked by. Had the submarine escaped? But below the surface, Amberger had to make a desperate decision. Fanning's depth charge had struck close. The hull was unbreached, but the shock had disabled the motors and shut off the oil leads, essentially cutting off fuel. Of more immediate concern, the blast had jammed the diving rudders, making the boat uncontrollable underwater. The U-58 was slowly sinking, and Amberger's crew couldn't stop it. If it sank too deep, it would be crushed. The officers discussed the situation and concluded that there were only two choices. Either sink and wait to be crushed, or blow the ballast tanks, surface, and surrender. The boat was at nearly 200 feet, already below its test depth, when Amberger ordered the crew to blow the ballast tanks. The submarine's stern appeared first, tilted some 30 degrees, showing the aft torpedo tubes, and then the conning tower came up. Nicholson rapidly closed and dropped another depth charge close aboard, an explosion throwing the bow up rapidly. The destroyers opened fire with their guns, fanning from her stern and Nicholson from her bow, and at least one struck. The door of the conning tower opened, and Captain Lieutenant Amberger came out, his hands raised in surrender. He was shouting, Comrade! Comrade! The word that German troops used when they surrendered to allies. One after another, the crew came out with their hands raised. Under the cover of the Nicholson's guns, the fanning came alongside, but the submarine started to settle. German officers had been ordered not to allow their submarines to be captured, and so they had sent sailors below to open the seacocks. The U-58 sank before it could be taken under tow. As the boat sank, the surrendering men jumped into the water, swimming for the fanning. Four men became entangled in the radio antenna and were dragged under, but all managed to free themselves. The men of the fanning were throwing lines over the side. Some of the U-58 crew were climbing aboard, but it quickly became obvious that many of the men were near exhaustion. They had to tie a line around themselves and be pulled up like giant fish. One was so exhausted he could not adjust the rope under himself. Two members of Fanning's crew, Chief Pharmacist Mate Elixir Harwell and Coxswain Francis Connor, jumped in to save him. They managed to get him aboard, but he couldn't be resuscitated. U-58 crewman Franz Glinder died on the deck of USS Fanning, the only casualty of what was called the action of 17 November, 1917. According to Admiral Sims, Amberger, dripping wet, walked up to Carpenter, clicked his heels in the most ceremonious German fashion, and surrendered himself, his officers, and his crew. The action represented the first time the United States Navy was confirmed to have sunk an enemy submarine in combat. The entire combat lasted less than 15 minutes. Life was difficult aboard a World War I U-boat, when the crew of U-58 were issued soap by the Americans, a commodity that was in short supply in Germany at the time, it was the first time they'd seen any in month. Given dry clothes, issued cigarettes and rations, and perhaps just happy to be alive, the new prisoners of war broke into song. Captain Amberger later wrote that the Americans were much nicer and more obliging than expected. The U.S. Navy decided to inter the crew of U-58 in the United States, where they thought it would be easier to feed them and much harder for them to escape. For their alert action, Cox and Loomis and Lieutenant Henry were awarded the Navy Cross. Berrien and Carpenter were both awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. Both men went on to become admirals. And crewman 
Harwell and Connor were given written commendations for the efforts to save the German U-boat crewman. Crewman Glinder was buried at sea with full honors. And in what many crewmen considered to be the greatest honor, Vice Admiral Sir Louis Bailey, the Royal Navy's Commander-in-Chief of the coast of Ireland, granted the crew of the Fanning permission to paint a star on the front funnel, representing the victory. Despite endless hours protecting convoys during the war, the Fanning was one of only two U.S. destroyers to earn that star. The convoy system worked. Merchant vessel losses went down, U-boat losses went up, bringing hope to the beleaguered forces of the Entente nations. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy, a little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get on the podcast. Today we're talking about destroyers. You've done quite a few stories about ships like these and stories like these, and I, I wanted to ask, is there something in particular about these kinds of stories that makes you want to tell them? I mean, there is, because, um, you know, people ask me favorites all the time, and I'm not very good at favorites. I always say my favorites, whatever I'm working yeah. on. But I do have, I mean, I do love these little destroyer stories. Uh, and I, I, there's good reason for it when you look at it. I mean, they're, they're, destroyers are really interesting boats because they have virtually no armor. They're not very durable ships. They have more attack capability than they have defense capability, which is largely what's true of a submarine, too. Uh, and so, I mean, it really is if you're, I mean, those destroyer fights, so many of them, I mean, it's really isolated. The whole idea is that, you you know, these are things that occur dispersed. So it's, it's often two fairly matched vessels, either which can very much realistically sink each other in a matter of strategy. And, and so, you know, we'll be making an episode on a whole... The whole, the whole battle took 10 or 15 minutes, and it was truly a life or death struggle. And I think that's a really, that's a really interesting thing to talk about with destroyers. They didn't, destroyers don't really have like hit points. You don't whittle them down. You're, you know, you, you're hit or you're not. The same thing is true largely of submarines. And so these really become interesting stories uh, of, of human drama and, and people really fighting over, you know, uh, fighting for their own lives. And uh, so I do. When people ask me favorites, I can't say that I do have a real love for these stories of the destroyers or the submarines. Those are, uh, in terms of war, that is really people that are living on the edge. You, know, you, you, you can go months and months and not have anything happen, and in a matter of five minutes, it's very easy for everybody on board to be killed. Uh, and so whenever you have those you know, duels between a destroyer and a submarine or a submarine and, and uh, you know, the submarine stories where they're attacking larger ships or whatever, those are, those are true stories of real compelling drama. And these are a couple of good, those good stories on that. So in terms of a behind the scene things, I've told a lot of these stories uh, because I actually, you know, personally find them a, a lot more interesting in terms of human drama than, say, trying to talk about a large naval battle where there's multiple ships involved and battleships are shooting at each other and stuff like that. Uh, those are a lot, not only a lot harder to tell, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's it's harder to get to the, you know, the real human part of that because they're, you know, they're big cogs in a machine. Whereas here, this really is two small vessels fighting you know to the death you know in uh, very remote usually conditions that's really interesting yeah those small actions of just truly human human reactions because you're, you're right it kind of and gives it a human scale once, once you have a victor uh then then they i mean they clearly both understand where they are because once you have a victor uh then the others always show at least uh you know a significant interest in trying to rescue the other side they understand the fight that was fought and they and they under, and so it's it's almost like you know teutonic knights or uh submarines and destroyers are, are very much like say the roman gladiators you know uh, a heavy and a light are two they, they have completely different strategies they have completely different abilities but they are so evenly matched that either might win in a fight to the death and both respect uh what the other one is doing and that's that's what you really get from these stories so they they that's that's compelling it's it's a good reason to talk about the stories and so these are I mean, both of the ones that are on today, I mean, those are both very short battles. They weren't long, prolonged, you know, strategic battles. They were very quick, sharp fights. Uh, and, uh, uh, and everybody on both sides knew the consequences, knew what they were doing and why. And yet, in terms of the overall war, that, you know, the battle of the Atlantic was probably the most important battle in both the First and the Second World War. That was, I mean, that was the one battle that had to be won uh, or you lose the war. And it was decided in a lot of ways by those tiny, yeah, those small the, little pitched the, battles. Know, thousands of small ship actions that went across the ocean, and they're all really, really fascinating. I've got a lot more of these on deck, too. There will be a, there will be a lot more. Uh, and I do find the World War I's, One's interesting because I think that the naval part of World War I is, is less discussed and less understood 
Uh, and so that, you know, it's, it, I think people are surprised to hear very World War II sounding stories that came out of the First World War. But really, they're, they're surprisingly similar. I mean, when you hear it, and if you're, if you're a, a, a crewman on a destroyer in the First World War and the Second World War, they both had very much the same experience in the Battle of the Atlantic. They spent most of their time chasing ghosts, you know, dropping depth charges on an oil slick or a bit of foam, having no idea if there was a, 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 a certainly not sure if there was actually a submarine down there, if there was, if you'd hit it, uh, you know, and you would do that a thousand times before you actually saw something. And the, the thing is, it was really, really very rare is that you could actually see the results of the fight, that you actually viewed the enemy that you were fighting. It almost never happened for those destroyer crews. And they, they talk about it very much the same in both in both sides. And in both wars, I mean, you know, people, because today a destroyer is one of the largest uh, ships at sea. I mean, aside from aircraft carriers, no one's really producing cruisers anymore. There's still a few of them at sea, but I mean, no one's really producing cruisers anymore. Destroyers are the largest naval ships that are being produced. And people don't you know, think about it, that destroyers in the Second World War were really a fairly small ship. Uh, and uh, they were, you know, small, nimble ships. And we had smaller. We had you know, we had uh, the anti-submarine ships and the and the destroyer escort, which is really frigate sized. But I mean, these are these are not large vessels at sea. These are these are small, fragile, uh, agile vessels. Uh, and uh, and there's a reason they call them tin cans because it was very easy for a single torpedo to 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 sink a destroyer. So in these in these fights, I mean, it is absolutely uh, a, a submarine has the capacity to sink a destroyer, and a destroyer has the capacity to sink a submarine, and absolutely, uh, you have a very good likelihood of extreme loss of life among your crew if that happens. And so when they when they went at it, I mean, they were this was a fight to the death. Yeah, destroyers. I mean, I think destroyers have an interesting mm -hmm. history in their own right, where they actually just start. They started as Tor a torpedo, torpedo boat. So, so you invent the torpedo, and then you realize, hey, you know, this torpedo yeah. could sink a major surface ship if you just put it on a rowboat. So they get these little fast, speedy, cheap boats with the idea that a torpedo can come in. I think it was in the uh, the war in the Pacific uh, that, that that actually the first time it happened when a capital ship was sunk by a torpedo, and suddenly navies realize, oh my goodness, these massive, expensive capital ships are now at risk from these tiny little speed boats. So then they build a ship that was optimized to attack those little boats, and then they realize, well, we can put torpedoes on that too. And and then their role comes out to be picket yeah. ships and, and all sorts of stuff. So it's really interesting how they how they evolve. But you're right. I mean, the, what's the term destroyer mean? Well, it was torpedo boat destroyer. They weren't they weren't invented to chase submarines. They weren't invented to be airplane destroyers. Which is, I mean, they were used as picket ships in the Second World War. They were invented to take on small patrol boats that could sink a major ship. And they, they were still used in that role. Uh, but I mean, there's so it's really interesting how their roles evolved yeah. and how they were used during the war. But I mean, the, the advent of submarine warfare in the First World War meant that you had to disperse your fleet to go chase these submarines because they could be anywhere. Uh, and you simply couldn't do that with these major surface elements, especially if the major surface elements were, you know, trying to bottle up the enemy fleet or trying to be available in case you had a fleet action. And so that yeah. ends up having all sorts of small ships out there. That leads to the, uh, you know, a, the, the drama of naval war that was not large fleet action but was small ship to ship action of course that was always there that was always, i mean the, some of the most interesting battles in the you know yeah. the revolutionary war or the, or the napoleonic wars were sometimes when you had small fleet elements that were fighting each other you know two two frigates that were fighting or something like that but uh, that's what happened in the in the two in the two world wars is that the destroyers became a unique part of the war they were certainly part of the fleet element they were a necessary part of the fleet element and that you would get to these you know out literally you know miles from anything certainly miles from anything that could be help uh, and uh, you were you know you were fighting to the death with another ship uh, that could easily sink your ship and those you know those are those are compelling stories everyone always ends up being a really just an interesting compelling story the, this this battle the one with the mm -hmm. uh, fanning is a fairly fairly late it was, well, of course, in World you know, War the United I. States entered late in World War One, but the first the kind of the first thing we did was Sim said let's send our destroyers out and and uh, that's one of one of the first ways that the U S really entered the war was to send our chunks of the navy out to and and uh, they, at first they wanted to station them in France but there wasn't enough room there so they ended up stationing them in uh, you know the coast of England and Ireland uh, and and to use those for uh, submarine hunting and for convoy escort. And so these, I mean, these were the, really the first Americans that were putting their lives at risk in the, in the Great War and, and in some ways played, you know, an incredibly significant role in that. If it weren't for these destroyers protecting convoys, then there's no way that the, A, the AEF gets there with a million men to be able to shift the tide in, in Europe because it wouldn't have, you know, there's no way the U.S. population was going to accept massive losses uh, due to transports being sunk. 
Yeah, before they even get to the... Yeah, so in many ways, I mean, it's not just the Battle of the Atlantic that is supply for England. It's also this is what brings the AAF to Europe, which is, you know, what many argue at least is what shifted the tide and forced the Germans into the offensives in, in 1919 that would eventually lead to the, you know, the 100 days offensive and in the war. I mean, all that depends upon the ability to defend from the submarines, which, you know, comes from the destroyers. And that's where one of the first places the United States was making a difference. But, of course, the British had much more experience with it by that point, and the Commonwealth had much more experience with that point so there there were really very few actions where u.s ships you know actually encountered and did anything about submarines the vast majority of the time they never saw them so this is yeah. a it's relatively late in the war it's it's the very first example and i think it's one of only three of the entire war where a u.s destroyer uh, sank uh, a confirmed sank a german u-boat yeah one of the one of the other confirmations too i had seen they at the time they didn't confirm it um and there's still some disagreement over whether <laughs> what balloon or what submarine was actually mm -hmm. sunk there but they had a particular submarine that they thought was in the area um they reported that they believed they had hit it but uh, they had decided oh that's not that's not confirmed but they later confirmed it because the submarine never showed up again there was a lot of that in both wars where we're not really sure what happened to the submarine whether someone thought they sunk it and then that submarine would pop up later and i mean it was very difficult to confirm a submarine kill and that's one of the things that's interesting i mean in the fanning there was no question right i mean the submarine it, you know raised went sunk and yeah. they saw it happen and they captured crew members and, uh, and that's true actually in both i think the stories today it's true the roper too that was uncommon uh, and that is for the most part, you drop depth charges and you you think you might hit something maybe you saw some debris you don't know if you killed it or not uh, and a lot of times, you know, uh, we didn't find out until after the war. We could search the German records to figure out what happened to the submarine to get an idea. One of, one of the examples of that is if you ask anybody in the Civil Air Patrol, there is an example of the Civil Air Patrol sinking a U-boat off of Florida. It's famous. It's, there's a painting of it. But uh, the Navy doesn't admit that the Civil Air Patrol sank any submarines. And uh, because there's, hmm. just, there's a, a disagreement over, you know, uh, we really don't know for sure when and how and when submarines were lost at sea. And, and so it's, it's always been an interesting question. If they're already underwater yeah. and they sink, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just said so. It's hard to. I mean, it's, sometimes there's you know you tell from debris, but I mean sometimes they can leave debris and not and not have been sunk. And I mean, uh, so there were lots of examples where they were reported sunk, and then that same submarine would actually you know be fighting months later, and they found out that it wasn't. It was you know that they just chased it, and and thousands and thousands of examples where they drop depth charges on something that might have been or might not have been a submarine, and we have no idea, uh, you know. And so, I mean, we I'm sure we depth charged a lot of fish in the Second World War, the First World War, both. Uh, you, you would just see, you know, foam. You would see something that looked like a wake. You would see something that looked like an oil slick. And, you know, they would, you know, they were trained for this, and they knew that if it was a submarine, it could threaten them, and they would just go, you know, chuck depth charges at it. We honestly don't know if there was a submarine or not. So if there was one down there, and it you was weren't deep, taking any chances, and, you know, and, and a depth charge caused its hull to implode, how would anybody know? Uh, because uh, there, you know, there would be no evidence of it. You might find it, you know, 50 years down the road, which we've seen a lot of that where we've we've identified submarines and ones that were sunk. And that, that's actually and then, and then trying to from that evidence to to figure out then who who must have sunk it. It's always an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, which sometimes I think it's it's easier and other times we're like, I don't know. We have no idea who I mean, sunk that, this that thing. That was true of, say, air kills, too. I mean, there was uh, both sides over over claimed their air kills. They were oh, sure. Yeah. And this was this wasn't pilots that were trying to inflate their reputation. Sometimes it was governments that were trying to propagandize. But most for the most part, these are pilots who legitimately thought they'd shot down an airplane. And, and uh, it's very difficult to confirm that. Uh, and so, you know, the numbers were always yeah. exaggerated. Um, that, that does remind me of the, the Battle of Kursk. Russia, the, the Soviets saying in the news that, oh, we've destroyed like hundreds of German mm -hmm. Tiger tanks, hundreds of them. And first of all, there were there were not hundreds of them at Kursk. But I think I remember reading that there was maybe one Tiger lost mm -hmm. at Kursk and uh, it wasn't to enemy fire. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this, so I mean, it was very common in the war to misidentify Tiger. Everything became a Tiger as soon as Tiger tanks were out there. But also, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you would shoot and get a direct hit and you think you'd, you destroyed the tank and it might have just driven away. I mean, you know, you don't know. I mean, there's smoke and, and movement of battle. Yeah, yeah you're usually not yeah, sticking you know, around, you know, perhaps. You park your tank and go check because there's other people shooting at you. Yeah. So, so that's, it's very easy to, so yeah. think about that when, if you do hit it and, and, and it sinks, you know, <laughs> 10 stories under the ocean, <laughs> then you yeah. can see how difficult that was. And you can see how frustrating that must have been to the crews. I mean, you, if you were to talk to the crews of U.S. destroyers in the First World War, I would think that the, the bulk of them would tell you that they were pretty sure at some point that they'd sunk a submarine. And yet I think there were only, there were only three that ended up getting the star on their, on their funnel. 
Uh, and and that's I mean that's got to be very frustrating for you to be you know there to fight the war and there to make a difference and you're never really sure if you ever you know if you had a, ever hit anything that you're shooting at. So these are these are different and compelling stories both of these in that in that uh, we know you know we actually know what happened we know what happened with the crew and we could actually see it happen and but even when you get to those you can see just how how exciting I mean that's what I'm trying to encapsulate when I make these episodes is uh, you know, they always say that you know that. The service during wars is hours and hours of boredom followed by a few moments of terror and you know here just to get you know what that must be like and the feeling that you must have the adrenaline that you must have the excitement that you must have the feelings you're contributing that you must have but the terror that you must have because you know that your life is at risk on both sides it's these are just compelling stories of drama and you see that when the battle's over because they uh, suddenly you know the humanity immediately comes out as you as you develop sympathy for the people whose you know ship you just blew up and it's, uh, these are they're just they're just interesting and compelling stories. And uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of these stories to tell. Well, and it's it's interesting, you know, in World War One, there there was not a lot of surface combat, surface fleet yeah, there's, combat. There's only so many ways you can tell Jutland, you know, and and uh, that's so. I mean, there were, there were there were some you know surface elements, and there was the Battle off of the Falklands and stuff like that. And those are interesting stories. But I mean, honestly, the naval war in the First World War is boring, except for the Battle of the Atlantic cool about this story is that for most of the sailors and there were lots and lots of sailors who served you know they didn't end up shooting in uh, in anger very mm -hmm. often but the for these destroyers which ended up doing most of the if there was combat i mean it was these destroyers fighting yeah. taking greater risk really than the capital ships now admiral sims said i mean his argument was that because the grand fleet including you know the u.s battleships like the texas because the grand fleet had bottled up the german fleet the high seas fleet that's what allowed them to free the destroyers to go for the anti-submarine action and so you have to see it as the, you know the, the whole broader battle it all ties together i mean the the, the fact that because you can't you know yeah. destroyers out hunting submarines are, are toast if they run into battle cruisers but on the other hand when you get to it the, the part that we're actually talking about and the part that you know we, it, we, it's not all that compelling to tell as a history guy story and that is the by far the most deadly tool that was used against submarines in the first world war were the mines and you can talk a little bit about the mine barrage, but I mean, a submarine, you know, battling it out with a mine is much less dramatic tale than them having a fight with a destroyer. And so, you know, we don't tell that story much. We've told it some, but I mean, it, you know, it largely comes to the submarine radios where on one side of the uh, the mine barrage, we're going to go through the way we think we know how, and then they don't come home. Uh, yeah, like I said, there's only so many ways that you can talk about Jotland. The, the yeah. people and the destroyers were really putting their lives on the line, and those battles just had to be, you know, I mean, there's, you know, quick, sharp bloody actions that occurred uh, and uh, that, you know, all together add to a massive campaign that the war hinged on. Uh, this one's interesting, too, because you know, talk about the fact that they're just dropping depth charges on oil slicks. The, mm -hmm. This was one guy. Had apparently extraordinary eyes. And one of, the, one of the things that's interesting is the Germans had invented a much narrower periscope that was meant to be very hard to observe. I mean, your problem is always going to be no matter how small your I mean, it was pencil thin, but no matter how small your periscope, it's going to leave a wake. And uh, and that's it's You know, it's, if you've ever just stood in the ocean, especially if it's choppy at all, it's got to be hard to see a wake. But I mean, you can still see it. But yeah, apparently this this one guy who was standing on the deck of the fanning had really good eyes. But also the deck officer, the officer that was in uh, that was in command of the bridge at the time, uh, was incredibly competent uh, for him to be able to react uh, so quickly and do it. Uh, it was also just amazing. And so it's really these two working together. And it would have been extremely easy to miss that that submarine was there. It could have been one of those examples where a ship blew up and you had no idea where it came from. Uh, but instead, and you know, that's uh, turned out to be bad for the U-boat that they happened to run into the wrong crew at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah, it did. And that just, well, and they even, they saw the ship close and they, they yeah. were like, oh, crud, we gotta, we need to pull the yeah, periscope down and hide. And it, yeah, they were, they were spied and that was that. And you have to wonder how many times a U-boat was, you know, approaching a convoy, saw an escort and got away and no one was the wiser. Uh, and this just is one of those where it happened to be that right at the right time, the guy that was, that had, you know, this preternaturally uh, effective eyesight happened to spy <laughs> it. And that was, that was that for the ship. And that, that's, that's the life you lived. You never, you know, you know, it had to be a terrifying life as a as a u-boat crewman it really did because uh, you knew you were quite vulnerable yeah. if they even saw you and so it was i mean it's strategy and tactics and uh, individual skill and and luck and all that is is driven into this this prolonged fight to to preserve the the supply line between north america and the united kingdom one of the things that a lot of the people made 
uh, talked about in the comments of this one is uh, how amazing it really is that literally, you know, minutes after they'd been trying to sink this bat, this submarine, they were trying to mm -hmm. save the lives of the crew. And that's, I, I, it really is, it's very incredible that they were risking, they were doing everything they could. It's an interesting uh, contrast with the Roper, because that's the other one that we're talking about today, where they were, you yeah. know, dropping depth charges, and even though they knew that there were people in the water. And there were different situations between the two. But I mean, part of that, you know, what I just mentioned is that they all, they knew that their lives were at risk. They knew how they would want to be treated. And they, you know, and and, and they knew that these men were defenseless. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it's it's strange how one moment you're like, kill them, and the next moment you're like, save them. But I mean, that's, that's kind of how, you know, war is. We find and those stories occur again and again and again. Uh, I mean, uh, in, on on land and air and sea. Uh, but I mean, here that was certainly that was that was part of the idea is that the, these sailors were defenseless and they were going to do everything they could to save them, and that there were Americans risking their lives to pull the men out of the water is, was extraordinary. Part of it might had to uh, had to do with you know the fact that America had really just entered the war and hadn't. I mean, these you know it, if you had been a Royal Navy. Uh, sailor, then, you know, you might have uh, been a little bit more jaded in that instance. But I think uh, uh, maybe Americans were still, you know, behaving like, you know, like they hadn't been worn down by years of war, like other combatants might have been. Everybody had an understanding that, you, that you're not you're not there just to needlessly kill. But it is interesting. It's it's fascinating that one moment you're dropping depth charges on them, and the next moment that you know, people are literally jumping in the water to pull in exhausted, you know, uh, submariners and, and get them on the boat. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? And I'm always watching. I watch documentaries all the time. I watch Magellan quite quite often, almost every day. And that's what I do when I'm taking breaks, when I'm writing and stuff like that. Uh, so the one that I, that I picked here was... Uh, uh, a straight-up nature documentary. I decided I really wanted to just do, a, you know, an old-fashioned nature, nature do documentary. The one I stumbled on was the Ten Deadliest Snakes with Nigel Marvin. And actually, I, I I had never heard of Nigel Marvin. Apparently, he's quite famous in the United Kingdom. Uh, he is a biologist who's done several shows, but he's he's compared a lot to Steve Irwin because he has that you know huge enthusiasm for it, and because he seems to take stupid risks that make you you know gasp. So in and in this one, what he does is eight different episodes. He goes to different places. There's one on the United States, and there's I haven't watched all eight yet. There's one on South Africa. But what he does, is he goes finds the ten deadliest snakes there, and he goes and finds them all in the wild, and, and for the most part picks them up. He you know he uses a little snake hook, and then you have to grab its tail so it doesn't crawl up the snake hook and bite you, and then he's with his oh, if the snake bites you you die and he's sitting there playing with it so uh it is that's old-fashioned documentary sort of stuff and it does uh, i have to admit first of all i'm a little bit creeped out by snakes and the second of all as a former park ranger i'm like don't touch the animal don't play with the wild animals uh, but it's really fast i've learned a lot about them i've learned some of the things i thought i knew about snakes were not necessarily true it's compelling because you know he's 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 literally got these things in his hands while he's telling you about what you know what they do and how many people they kill and you know what have you been watching well, I was thinking I actually was kind of in the same mood as you. I've had I've had a bit of a week and so I decided, you know, I want something that's not a not terribly thinky. And so I went and found Hummingbirds with David Attenborough. It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. The the thing that's coolest about this one is just the uh, the shots. They're doing slow motion 4K shots of these hummingbirds. These hummingbirds are absolutely beautiful. These are, they went and did a lot of the ones in South America, which are a bit more showy than the ones that I've seen here in the, in the States. It teaches you just about everything you would want to know about a hummingbird, how they just kind of live on this edge of their hyper hyperactive. They burn all this energy. They don't really sleep. They go into like a torpor where they use one one hundredth of their energy at night. But the, the shots are just incredible. And they have this other bird that is like tries to pretend to be a hummingbird. And so it like does this thing where it'll like flap twice and then try to like stay in place. And they, they did this thing where they're just comparing it like they're showing that bird trying to fly in place and then a hummingbird flying in place and it really makes that other bird just look like a clumsy little <laughs> he's he's out there desperately trying to remain in place almost tripping over himself and the hummingbird's like what like it's hard these are meticulously crafted beautiful documentaries that they choose to put on there the filming is incredible and this stuff is 4k you can watch it in just absolute crazy fidelity and of course for anyone who is watching or listening to the history guy you can go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy and there will always be an offer up there usually something like free month or a free uh, or a discount off of an annual membership try.magellantv.com slash the history guy next the history guy is going to talk about the uss roper and the first submarine sunk by americans during world war ii <laughs> 
and stay tuned after the episode to hear us talk a little more with the History Guy. Rarely is the drama of war seen more starkly than in the small ship actions of the Second World War's Battle of the Atlantic, where German submarines and the naval vessels built to fight them engaged in often lonely actions far out to sea where either vessel could easily be destroyed. The actions were short, sharp, and often terrifying for their crews. One such action represented a significant milestone, the first time a U.S. Navy vessel sank a German submarine off the coast of the United States in the Second World War, but the action was cloaked in secrecy, it was surrounded by controversy, and it wasn't even fully recounted until long after the war. The action on April 14, 1942, between the destroyer USS Roper and the German submarine U-85 deserves to be remembered. USS Roper was commissioned February of 1919, one of 111 Wix-class destroyers built between 1917 and 1921. The Wix class were among those called flush deck destroyers because they did not have a raised forecastle like on previous classes, and also called four stack destroyers for their four funnels. Like most vessels of the Wix class, Roper came too late to participate in the Great War, although she was in service soon enough to participate in post war relief activities. She also served in the Asiatic Squadron before being decommissioned and placed in reserve in 1922. Recommissioned in 1930, Roper served both in the Pacific and the Atlantic fleets. Noted science fiction author Robert Heinlein briefly served aboard Roper in 1933. In the fall of 1939, USS Roper was serving off of New England when it participated in the Neutrality Patrols. While officially remaining neutral, the ships of the Neutrality Patrol would patrol an area that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had designated as a protected zone that eventually went almost all the way to Iceland. Although at first, at least, the U.S. ships wouldn't attack the German submarines. They would merely report their location to British and Canadian ships. At the start of the war, U.S. naval assets were spread thin and largely unprepared for the German U-boat threat. Notably, the Navy had a significant shortage of vessels specialized for anti-submarine duties. U.S. losses to German U-boats along the East Coast were extreme. The first attacks in January 1942 were made by the large, long-range German Type 9 U-boats. Those attacks were so successful and the targets so plentiful that the German Navy followed by sending smaller Type 7 U-boats as well. These smaller submarines weren't built to operate so far abroad. They had to be literally crammed front to back with supplies and use special measures even to reach the United States. But still, the U.S. defense measures were so haphazard that even the Type 7 boats found significant success off the coast of the United States. By the end of March, the German U-boats had sunk more than 60 vessels off the U.S. East Coast and thousands of tons of shipping, much of it in the part of North Carolina's Outer Banks, ominously called Torpedo Alley. In exchange, the United States Navy was yet to sink a single German U-boat. Roper, having returned from escorting a convoy to Ireland, was patrolling Torpedo Alley, the shipping lanes between Cape Hatteras and Chesapeake Bay, one of the two few U.S. vessels trying to stem the tide of the U-boat attacks. She was under the command of 38-year-old Lieutenant Commander Hamilton Wilcox Howe, a 1926 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. The duty was hazardous. In February, the Wix-class destroyer Jacob Jones had been sunk by torpedoes from the U-578. Only ten members of her crew had survived. Roper had had close calls in the early days of the Battle of the Atlantic. She had encountered a U-boat on the surface on January 19th, but the Roper's depth charge rack had jammed and the U-boat captain had been able to escape. In March, they had made contact with three U-boats on the surface, but the Roper was alone and only had 14 depth charges available. When the U-boats pursued Roper, Howe tried to get them to separate, but when they wouldn't, he was forced to outrun them rather than engage in a battle that would have been lopsided against Roper. The Roper had rescued many victims of U-boat attacks, including 27 survivors of the steamer SS New York in a lifeboat on March 31st. A pregnant woman had given birth on the lifeboat and had given the child the middle name Roper in recognition of the vessel that had rescued them. Roper was on patrol off North Carolina's Cape Hatteras the night of April 13th. The night was described as clear, with many stars visible. The sea was very nearly calm, the water phosphorescent. Six minutes after midnight on the 14th, she acquired a radar contact, which was of a type that could have been a submarine. They weren't far from the coast, as the light from the Bodie Island Lighthouse, as well as the Bodie Island Lighted Bellboy number 8, were discernible to the ship's starboard. The radar contact was then confirmed with a sound man contact, which could hear rapidly turning screws. Roper could see the wake of the vessel in the phosphorescent water. 
As Roper approached within 2,100 yards, it still wasn't clear what vessel they were pursuing. They said it appeared to be a small Coast Guard vessel, but its speed indicated that it could still be a submarine. And so Roper was called to general quarters, and her weapons, including 30 and 50 caliber machine guns, 3-inch naval guns, depth charges, and torpedoes, were prepared for immediate action. At that point, the target, which had apparently become aware of Roper's pursuit, started to turn to port. Roper, aware there was a danger from torpedoes, moved for a position on the target's starboard quarter to make torpedo attack difficult. It was a good choice. As they approached within 700 yards, a torpedo was observed that nearly missed Roper, passing close aboard down the port side. The Roper now knew this was an enemy, but it was not until they approached within 300 yards that the target cut sharply to starboard, and Roper's 24-inch searchlight illuminated it and identified it as a large submarine. The deck officer noted the submarine was painted with a camouflage, predominantly light in color. The submarine was the Type 7B U-boat, U-85. Commissioned in June 1941, the U-85 was one of more than 700 Type 7 U-boats that comprised the backbone of the German U-boat fleet. The Type 7 was the most produced submarine type in history. The U-85, under the command of 26-year-old Oberlieutenant Zersi Eberhard Greger, was on its fourth patrol and had already sunk more than 15,000 tons of Allied shipping including the Swedish freighter Christina Knudsen, sunk off New Jersey, April 10th. Gregor had the U-85 on the surface, likely charging his batteries when it was spotted by Roper. He likely kept on the surface because the U-boat was much faster on the surface than it was submerged, and he had hoped to shake the Roper, but Roper had stayed on target. The U-85 had fired a torpedo from its aft tube at Roper, but when the torpedo missed, it became clear that the U-85 was going to have to stand and fight. Gregor was turning the submarine in order to bring her deck gun to bear. The submarine had a tighter turning radius and was turning sharply to starboard. While the searchlight kept the submarine illuminated, Roper's guns went into action. First the machine guns, and then the three-inch battery. Forced into a fight, the submarine crew were rushing for their deck gun, but were cut down by the machine gun fire. A three-inch gun under the command of coxswain Harry Heyman fired for its first time in combat, scored a hit on the conning tower at the waterline, puncturing the submarine's pressure hull, and the submarine began to sink, stern first. Howe ordered a torpedo attack, but the submarine disappeared before it was fired. Despite seeing approximately 40 members of the submarine's crew in the water, Roper fired a barrage of 11 depth charges over the submarine's location. In the darkness, they could not see wreckage. At the time, Roper made no attempt to rescue the crew of the U-85. Howe noted that the Roper at least twice came near survivors from the submarine. Cox and Heron, who had fired the shot that crippled the U-boat, recalled in a journal hearing the German shouting, Comrade, indicating surrender. But Hughes considered rescue attempts to be too dangerous at night because submarines were known to operate in pairs. As Heron noted, you were like a sitting duck every time you stopped to pick up survivors. Instead, Roper waited until morning when a Catalina PBY operated by the Naval Reserve arrived and could watch over the area. By then, it was 7 a.m. The PBY noted suspicious oil slicks and debris. The plane dropped a depth charge on one potential target and Roper dropped two more. More planes started to arrive, and one dropped markers called smoke floats near what appeared to be bodies in the water. Roper, now under the protection of aircraft, placed two boats in the water. As they searched, an airship arrived as well and began patrolling for evidence of more submarines. In all, Roper noted seven aircraft arrived on scene. At 10 till 8, the first boat came back to Roper with five bodies. None of the U-boat crew were found alive. An hour later, as the ship was recovering bodies, the ship made another sonar contact and dropped four more depth charges. They observed one large air bubble and one small air bubble in addition to fresh oil. The airship, whose great advantage was the ability to stay on target for longer than an airplane, kept watch of the spot and noted that bubbles continued to come up. A marking buoy was dropped on the location, which, in view of the proximity of the bodies and debris, the sharp sound contact of an object which remained stationary, and the large air bubbles which persisted, how assumed, was the location of the sunken submarine. In all, Roper retrieved 29 bodies, including those of two officers. Two more bodies were allowed to sink, and 15 empty life vests were found. Six escape lungs were also recovered, and at least two of the bodies had mouthpiece tubing in their mouths, indicating they'd escaped after the submarine sank. Curiously, some of the bodies were wearing civilian clothes and carrying wallets with United States currency and identification cards, suggesting that part of the U-85's mission was to drop off spies. While destroying the first U-boat off the U.S. East Coast since the U.S. entered the war was significant, the U.S. was more interested in gaining intelligence from the U-85 and in keeping the German Navy in the dark as to what happened to the boat. The victory by Roper was not reported in the news. The bodies of the crew members were taken to Norfolk Naval Air Station to gather what intelligence they could find, and then were photographed 
fingerprinted, and buried with honors after dusk on April 15th at Hamden National Cemetery. The coffins were carried by an honor guard. More than a dozen officers participated in the funeral. Final rites were said by both Catholic and Protestant chaplains. Twenty-four sailors fought a three-volley salute as a bugler paid taps. But the civilians standing outside the cemetery had no idea who was being buried. The headstones only included names, not ranks, nor service branch, nor date of death. A short statement was released in July describing the burial rites, but did not include the name of the submarine, the vessel that sank it, nor the date of its sinking. The full story was not released until after the war. Howe's decision to forego any rescue attempt for more than seven hours after the vessel sank and to drop depth charges in the water despite knowing that there were survivors in the water is controversial to this day. But historian Clay Farrington of the Hampton Roads Naval Museum notes that you can't Monday morning quarterback this sort of thing. They didn't call them wolf packs for nothing. There might have been another U-boat in the water waiting to take its shot. Moreover, Harrington noted that they would have known that the crew were intelligence assets. The rubber would preferred to have taken them alive if they could have. The U-85 sank in 110 feet of water in the weeks after its sinking U.S. Navy divers attempted to enter the wreck and see if they could recover the submarine's Enigma code machine, but they were unsuccessful. The submarine rescue vehicle USS Falcon also arrived and tried to salvage the U-85, but the damage to the pressure hull was too significant and they were unable to refloat the submarine. Lieutenant Commander Howe was awarded the Navy Cross for the action and Coxon Heyman was awarded the Silver Star. Howe later achieved the rank of Rear Admiral. Like many four stackers, Roper was later converted into a high-speed transport. She served in the Mediterranean and then in the Pacific. On May 25, 1945, she was struck by a kamikaze off of Okinawa. The war ended before repairs could be completed, and she was finally scrapped in December 1946. USS Roper's anchor is on display at the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The wreck of the U-85 is a popular diving destination, and while the Coast Guard is moving to protect the wreck, several items have been recovered from the wreckage by divers, including a silver tea set and the missing Enigma code machine, which is now on display at the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras, North Carolina. Despite these stories happening 25 years apart, two different wars, uh, they're tied together by some really striking similarities, and not really just because they were respectively the first ships to the first American destroyers to sink submarines, German submarines, in the First and Second World War. Uh, but they're similar in so many other ways. It's interesting that, that uh, when you have a destroyer fighting a submarine out at sea, uh, how little different the Second World War was from the First World War. There were changes in technologies on both sides. Um, depth charges certainly got better. What mostly got better was, say, sound equipment, and that was something that the Royal Navy didn't pay attention to really until between the wars. But in the end, still, when you when you get down to you know the two of them fighting, it still comes to very similar tactics and uh, a very similar dynamic where you you know that that feeling of terror and, and adrenaline, and you have to move at it quickly. And uh, and that's uh, so yeah, you can definitely see the similarity between these two. There were some interesting differences between the two too. But uh, amazing similarities, and you, I mean, really, you think the crews were uh, feeling pretty much the same emotions in the same way, you know, in, in two different wars. Roper was really out on its own. I mean, others, I mean, eventually airships and stuff showed up, but I mean, it would have been very, it, it, it would not have been surprising for that to have gone the other way, and for the Roper simply to have just, you know, been sunk, and, and for them to not ever figure out who had sunk them. And that did happen sometime during the wars. And Roper was an older vessel. Yeah, even that shot that went after it, that where we you know that barely missed it with that first torpedo, mm -hmm. that that could have been it. They could have been they could have made contact with the submarine and got hit. They might not even gotten it out on the radio. Yeah, because that was before they'd even identified it. Yeah, it's uh, which is just it's a really interesting. It's really interesting to me that despite so many changes, uh, there were experiences that were really so similar. I think if you took the the, the diary of a crewman on a World War One destroyer that was on anti-submarine patrol or on convoy duty, and a World War Two destroyer on the same duty, and you would find out that they were extraordinarily similar. And the that the submarines, despite new technologies, they were still just as even. Um, in terms of mm -hmm. combat. And so we, we, we've we talked about kind of, you know, how these technologies have changed. And ultimately, partially because the Roper was an older ship, uh, it was laid down in 1918. Um, it 
was in some ways its fighting with the submarine was more similar mm-hmm. to uh, the you know what the U.S. what the Fanning did because it was an older was, yeah. ship. But by the end of World War II, I mean, things had changed a lot. But, but one of the things that I think is interesting is that, uh, and you, you've told quite a few stories of destroyer escorts, mm-hmm. is that by, by World War II, destroyers were much uh, larger mm-hmm. ships and had mm-hmm. a con- considerably, I mean, they had a lot of firepower. They stopped, they actually kind of uh, had grown out of, its destroyer escorts ended up kind of taking some of the job and that the destroyers had played in World like War One. Some yachts and stuff like that taking on uh, the, the submarines too. And we'll probably tell some of those stories too uh, in time. But yeah. uh, it, it's true. I mean, the destroyer is a bigger ship in World War One than it, or in World War Two than it was in World War I. Uh, and it's true also that the Roper being older, it had some of the things that were typical of, of, of issues they had with those early, there was World War One era vessels in the fighting of the second world war they weren't agile enough they didn't have the turn radius that i mean that that was really the best that you needed if you were hunting submarines we really did optimize uh, either the destroyer escorts which were a frigate sized vessel or the even smaller submarine chasers uh, on the general idea that a single torpedo is going to take down a destroyer as much as a submarine chaser but a submarine chaser can move as quickly and actually is as good at carrying the ammunition that would be necessary whereas destroyers were multi-role they were also going to they were going to be doing a, a you know fleet yeah. screening and they were going to be message carrying and they were going to be doing uh, uh, reconnaissance and all sorts of, I mean, and uh, picket duty. And I mean, there's all sorts of ways that we need destroyers as part of a fleet. And the idea is a destroyer had to be able to keep up with the fleet elements, whereas uh, you wouldn't have to keep up with the fleet elements if you were one of the smaller, you know, destroyer escort or, or, uh, or, or submarine chasers. So there were some differences. And that's one of the things about, I mean, there's fewer of these, a destroyer versus a submarine during World War II, you get more like destroyer escorts or, or, or uh, submarine uh, uh, vessels against them. And that's sort of a little bit different. But uh, really, the biggest difference in technology, and there was certainly a difference in the capability of submarines, how deep they could go, how long they could go. But uh, the biggest difference in technology is that uh, between the wars, there was a good development in uh, the ability to identify submarines uh, and uh, from the simple hydrophone that had in the, in the First World War to eventually sonar so that we were much better able to see where a submarine yeah. was and where it was going. Uh, but there were uh, depth charges improved quite a bit too, the ability to set the depth of depth charges. And, and then of course the, uh, uh, the ones that would fire multiple depth charges that came out by the end of the Second World War, those were really the death of submarines, the ones that would fire a whole spread of them. Uh, but you know, at this point in the war, I mean, yeah. with the Rumpers there, they're using World War I depth charges with World War I Y guns. So you could put out a spread of, of essentially a diamond of four by rolling two off the back and shooting two off the sides. And it's very much like what you had going on in the first world war which is which i think is interesting is one of the interesting things about these two Mm -hmm. battles is that they were they were in that way Mm -hmm. very similar um and that it was both both these destroyers that were that were really not that dissimilar Mm -hmm. from each other i was i was looking at their even like their displacement and they're actually not uh, i mean the roper is larger than the fanning but not by as much as They're, they're kind of the same generation of destroyers there yeah that's true uh, and that's yeah. at the start of the Second World War. I mean, at the start of the First World War, we hardly had destroyers, and we sent pretty much all of them overseas. And then, and then we yeah. finally came to the conclusion that we shouldn't be building capital ships; that we should put our resources into building destroyers. That there were plenty of capital ships already in the in the Grand Fleet. Uh, and uh, uh, but in, again, in the beginning of the Second World War, we were really desperately thin on resources. And what we had, you know, uh, with the losses both at Pearl Harbor, but I mean, we just we just didn't have enough anti-submarine ships. Uh, we hadn't learned that lesson. And what we did have, we were using in convoy duty. So when, when you have you know, the happy time and you have all these submarines off the West Coast and they're sinking ships left and right, we didn't have a lot of ships to deploy. And so, I mean, the Roper was out on its own. Uh, and it was an older vessel. It wasn't one that we used to say would be ideal for the duty that it was doing. We didn't know where the submarines were. So this was really an interesting and desperate action. And one of the unique things about it is that we couldn't admit to it. I mean, here was the first time that an American ship had sunk one of those and we, were, yeah. uh, and, and we, we, we couldn't even tell the public that they had sunk it. And and uh, we didn't tell the Germans that they'd sunk it. I mean, it was kept secret. They buried the bodies in secret uh, uh, because they didn't want anybody to know that the rubber had had done that, which is, I mean, that's that's fascinating. It's, it's, it's completely different uh, uh, than, you know, fanning where we were, you know, cheering and putting the star on the, on the, on the, on it's saying, you know, here's where the American yeah. sank one. Here we're, we sank one. We totally don't want to tell anybody about it. And also because of how it occurred, when it occurred, instead of, you know, the desperate attempt to rescue the crew, there was, there was this, had to sit and listen to the crew dying and could not act because uh, so the submarines tended to act in pairs and they knew if they stopped to try to rescue ships, that they would put them at risk. Well, and the Ger- another German submarine, of course, it would mm-hmm. have taken the advantage of that. It common that was their training. It commonly happened. So the, the idea is you could not stop. And of course, it was night too. So I mean, if the by the time yeah. day came and they had they ended up getting a blimp and a bunch of airplanes and other ships showing up and stuff like that. I mean, if you then you could have you could have rescued some. But the fact that this happened. 
towards dusk that they didn't know what other sub or submarines might be out there and et cetera, meant that they, you know, they were, they, and they had, weren't even sure they'd sunk the submarine. They thought they were still getting pings off of what appears to have been the sunken yeah. submarine. And so they're still throwing depth charges in the water, even though there's men in the water because they think there's another submarine there. So, I mean, that's really a tragedy. And that's, you know, that's sometimes how war goes. But I mean, none, none of that was done, you know, crassly. None of it was because, oh, we want to kill the Jerry's. It was, it was all done because, you know, they, they, they were still fighting. And as far as I knew, still fighting a deadly enemy. And ultimately, I mean, as the captain of the American ship, you can't, you, you know that you can't risk your own sailors' lives un mm -hmm. unnecessarily. And so if the, if the risk is still significant, you know, he can't, he can't decide, ah, oh, well, we're not going to make a, <laughs> we're going to take a chance to save these guys, knowing that that was putting his own crew at significant mm -hmm. risk. I mean, of course he couldn't do that. Um, and it's, I mean, the Roper's really an interest. The Roper's honestly an interesting ship because it's also, I think, the only destroyer or one of very, very few ships that has uh, that had battle stars in all three um, theaters of the naval campaign because it got the star from the from the American theater here, and then it had a star in the Mediterranean, which was the the European, African, uh, Middle Eastern theater, and then it went mm -hmm. to the Pacific and it actually got hit by a kamikaze. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't end up they didn't even finish the repairs on it because the war ended but i it's that's that's mm -hmm. unique for a ship like that that it was this, a, that it had battle stars in all three ships, theaters yeah. that it went all around the world yeah and it, when you look at the size of it i mean imagine even even you know crossing the atlantic in that little boat and more or less you know crossing you know spinning around the world chasing you know chasing the enemy uh, it's a brave ship, and and this is an Crazy. interesting battle. It's a fascinating battle, being the first one, the first victory really against those U-boats out there on the East Coast. It's a fascinating battle because we had to keep it secret. It's a fascinating battle because of the ship that fought it, which was an interesting ship in itself. Uh, and so it's uh, it was a really uh, it's an interesting story to tell. Uh, and it's interesting because one of the very first episodes I did was about a little Coast Guard boat that was that sank a U-boat off of North Carolina. And those are the first German POWs taken in the Second World War by Americans. Uh, and at the time, uh, the Roper had yeah. sunk uh, had sunk a U-boat, but it wasn't it wasn't it hadn't been reported. No one knew that yet. Yeah, wasn't widely known. Well, and they didn't have any. Um, prisoners yeah, no from that one. And I, I mean, I think that we we kind of talk about the fact that that submarines were a psychological risk that people that we were afraid of them psychologically. We had already had years of them attacking the British ships and the kind of atmosphere that was around it is that we talk about, oh, it was wrong of them not to help these people. But I think that the we very much had a fear of what else could be out there. And they were they were not un, unreasonable fears. And this was right, I mean, right on the East Coast. It's it's incredible to think, I mean, how frightening must that be, yeah. too, is that we've we've barely entered the war and there are German submarines. And essentially, we have no idea how common those submarines could be on the coast, just threatening us and trying to send in, you know, fifth column mm -hmm. spies and... That's right. Some of the, some of the bodies from the sub from the submarine apparently were dressed in civilian clothes and had American money on them. So they were apparently that was one of the missions of it was to drop off spies. And yeah, I I, I mean it is. Oh, well, we know that they had tried to do that. You knew you had live people in the water, and you're still dropping ordnance in the water, and you're not you're not willing to put a boat down. And yeah. I mean that's terrible. I mean it is terrible to hear men dying and not not be able to react to it. But I think in the context of the fight, I mean, they, they really didn't have any choice because they knew if they if they stopped chasing, uh, especially since they were still getting sonar pings and stuff like that, because you don't really know where a submarine is, is that they knew that there was a true risk to the crew. So in, yeah. in retrospect, there wasn't apparently another submarine there that they could have stopped and, and rescued the crew and they could have had German survivors and they didn't. And that's tragedy. But I, I mean, I don't think that you can really second yeah. guess what the uh, what the officers of the Roper could have known at the time. Uh, but it does, I mean, that does, you know, uh, differentiate it from the fanning. But, of course, the fanning, too, uh, that submarine, there were, you know, there were several escorts around that convoy there. I mean, it wasn't like you were, you know, stopping and putting your single ship at risk. Or, I mean, if another submarine had popped up, there were other ships there to fight it. Oh, there was the second destroyer right there, yeah. uh, right there the with Nicholson, the fanning. Right? Yeah. That actually, and yeah, the, the Roper. Yeah, the Nicholson actually the Roper was alone. another episode that we did fairly recently, too. Yeah, but, uh, And it's, it's one of the funny things about that fanning episode is, like, you know, by the way, the captain of the Nicholson was the, the had been the, the coach of the Navy football team. And 
and and I you know and his record was on there and I don't you know it's always funny as we're deciding what to put in and what not to put in and I, I just thought it was too much not to put I thought it was not to put in what his record was in the Navy some people have mentioned that and, you know it's a little aside on there yeah I saw I saw I was as I was kind of refreshing myself on the on the episodes I saw the guy that was there was someone in the comments who was very happy that you had mentioned <laughs> yeah, the, just, his record because that was that was it's, important it's, it's, part it's of it's a funny little I mean it's a chunk of history and, and you know, the attempt there was to kind of humanize what's going on and uh, and, and so, I mean, it's fun when you're writing these episodes. It's amazing the stuff, you know, as you sit and make choices and what you have to leave in and what you, and because we, you know, we do want to put our episodes into a certain time frame and stuff. And, uh, and I mean, I, I always kind of laughed about putting that in there because I just decided to leave it in. But I mean, these, these are both such compelling, compelling stories. I mean, they're just really interesting, fascinating uh, stories and they, and they give that drama, uh, you know, uh, all throughout and it comes down to the same thing. These screws were fighting to the death. Well, I mean, one of the things I like about it is that this was that was the true story for, mm -hmm. I mean, millions of servicemen who fought in both wars, who uh, I, whether they were fighting, you know, at sea and having these these kinds of battles or whether they were fighting on, on you know, had these these specific experiences that they would have had on the ground is that we were trying to tell these stories of what these people actually went through and it's easy for us to talk about you know the giant strategic how you know how the americans were planning on doing this and planning on doing that and how we won the war but for the for veterans mm -hmm. that, that that wasn't really their experience of mm -hmm. the war and it was much more likely for us to see them um they had no idea what what the general was thinking and when you go to reading history and i do read a lot of history too you read more history than i do but i prefer those uh, a memoir of a specific soldier who was doing a specific thing uh, it's always to me a lot more compelling than something that's going to give a general you know overview of battles or wars or you know these, the yeah. second world war or even told from the perspective of a general uh, and some of those are really really fascinating there's some really good yeah. there's some really good pieces out there from someone who was just a, a junior officer somewhere and this was this was my you know my my you know three months of combat yeah and that's and they all had experiences that were mm -hmm. that were relevant and mattered and they did things they they did things that helped progress the war they also just simply were mm -hmm. the war is that no matter what the generals say i mean the, the people who actually fought this uh, they were the ones on the ground having every every single fear they were the ones who weren't sure if there was a second submarine that could you know very much have ended their lives it's it's just a very interesting it's it's a much more personal That's way to look at the fighting bolts flying their lives at risk their lives and their friends are at risk and, and uh... That's a very different idea. That's not necessarily what you hear. If you want to hear an overview of the Battle of Midway, that's a lot different than hearing what it was like if you were a pilot in the Battle of Midway. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.